Now we come to, to the last but not least. You can see he is the man behind all this, and I want you to give him a special clap for it, for organizing this conference so fast. He is co-chair of the Sustainable Development Social Network uh, under the UN, and uh, he heads the Jeffrey uh, Cha Center and the Jeffrey Sachs Center, not not sex, not sex center. <laughs> That'd be more fun. <laughs> we, <laughs> but we, we we are really grateful that he has organized this and that he's pushing forward this uh, SDG development. And, and Sunway is a classic example of not only being academic and talking talking about things, but delivering in the sustainable city that you see around us. And a lot of credit would go to him, Professor Wu. Thank you all for staying. Uh, uh, I was, well, the first question is uh, why immediate reforms? Mr. That was how the moderator started the session. Why should you ever do anything slowly unless you don't know what to do? Because you don't understand the situation. If you understand the situation and you know what, how to do it, you should move on to do it. But what if something occurs for the first time? So it's never happened before. So how do you know what to do? This is not the first time that a long established party has lost power. It has happened before in Mexico after 70 years, happened in Taiwan after 40 years, and happened in Korea in about the same time. So even though it's the first time that it happens here, but it's happened elsewhere before, you could have, the interested person could have analyzed and understood the, what they did there and what they should not have done, and, taking, and then you're modifying the solutions on the basis of local conditions. I think there are many things that could be done immediately, very easily, because we know how to do them. But given the time that we have to do, I will shrunk my 12 topics to three topics. Largely because the, like the star starts off with the headline, Mahatil is in, GST is out. How should we think about the nature of GST? I remember in around early 1992, I was contacted by the Chinese government about how is the quick way to raise revenue. Because under the strict central planning period, they had roughly 80% of GNP. And with the reform and decentralization, it has fallen, and it has reached 9% of GDP. For comparison, France is 35. Uh, United States is 25. You, Malaysia today is roughly 19. So to reach 9 is really low. When you're in such great for money, you reach for what I call the vacuum cleaner of taxes, something that just sucks it up. So, on January 1st, 1994, China implemented a GST because that was the most effective way to collect a lot of money. So, given the fact that GST is going to be removed, what are we going to do to make up for the, for the revenue? One thing is for sure. Let us recognize that GST is a highly unfair tax. It is 6% right now, which means that if you are really poor, 6% of your income is taken by the government. If you are rich, upper middle class, then 3% of your income has been taken by the government. Basically, the tax rate that you pay the amount of taxes, the proportion of income uh, goes down as your income goes up. Well, people said the financial markets would panic because the deficit would widen. Yes, it could, but 
that would be assumed that people in financial markets do not understand what a deficit means. In other words, if I am borrowing a million dollars, does that sound like a stupid proposition? It really depends on what I'm doing with that million dollars. And if there is a larger deficit, what is the government doing that is causing the deficit? The important thing is, is the deficit temporary or permanent? If it is, per if only if it is permanent, then there's going to be some quite negative consequences. If it is temporary, then why would it be temporary? It would be temporary be if it is temporary because income is going to grow faster and because when income grows faster, the state naturally collects more taxes. It's just like, why are there so few people paying income tax? Largely because people are too poor to pay, to qualify for the income tax. So you got a chicken egg problem. The best way to solve a shortage of money is that the people, the, short, the best way for government to solve is revenue shortage is for people to get rich so you can tax them, uh, keep the same tax rate and you collect more. So the question is really, how do you make the tax system pro-growth than just to support whatever the government wants to spend? So analysts would say, removing the GST, what are they replacing it with? And are they replacing it with a system that may have a temporary deficit increase, but a much lower structural deficit in the long run. So it's the systemic reform that people will look at to see the harm of GST event. So how do you make a tax system pro-growth? Well, one thing is for sure. Growth comes about from good policies and good luck. Let's talk about the policies because there's not much government could do about luck. Good policies would be that when you in try to induce growth, conditions are different in different places. So the trick of how you induce the growth has to be different across different places. It's just like how do you fight cancer even the same kind of cancer, the dosage and the particular chemical composition that you use depends on the, the condition of the particular individual, like how old is the individual, how much toxic, how much, uh, so the same thing of what are the particular conditions. Like uh, what you need, therefore, is lots of different ideas on what to do out there. And not only lots of different ideas, these ideas actually get implemented in different places because if it succeeds in location A, the people in charge in B, C, D, and E are going to copy the success in A and reproduce the success in the same location. It's just like Penang managed to get multinationals to come in and industrialize the state all of a sudden, the secret was out. Go for FDI. Do not be scared of foreign capital. And every Menteri Basar becomes a good host at dinner for foreign investors. So it is important, therefore, that the centers of policy initiative are spread all over the country in each of the state capital rather than just at the EPU in Putrajaya. Look at China. China's uh, system, tax, I'll come to the tax system, how it plays a role later. Basically, the, all the governors are competing of who can uh, grow highest in the old days, now who can grow highest and cleanest, because environment uh, 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 considerations are important. But what happened is why are they kind of compete? because they all want to be moved up the hierarchy in the Communist Party. You, would move, you could move to the Central Com you, the Politburo, and then the Crown, the Politburo Standing Committee. 
So there's competition among the governors to make economic growth. And similarly in the US, the governors all are interested in growth and good management because they have to stand for re-election. In China, they don't have to stand for re-election, but they have the chance of moving up if they do well. So you need competition among the governors because they are the ones who can implement things in their state. But in order for them to be able to implement their ideas, to test it out as a model for others to copy, they need to have the revenue to support the, in the particular initiative that they have launched. The supply of local infrastructure, for example, is very important. So that is why in the United States, each state has its own state income tax. And not only that, if the state has a good project, it could borrow, it could set up a state corporation, borrow the money, and undertake the project. So, we, but in Malaysia, that's not possible. The state get not, get, don't get the money. The state gets the money from the federal government. Basically, the federal government inhales all the revenue and then decides at the discretion which state would get it and which state would not get it. So basically, the, our, minister, our, our state uh, chief ministers do not have the financial resources to realize whatever good initiatives they may have. And this has to change. Basically, the only way to have multiple centers of policy initiatives, you need fiscal decentralization. The federal government should not collect so much of the money. The state should be collecting some of that money. So there should be a split in the revenue. Of course, whatever the federal government spends has an obligation to help the particularly poor countries the poor uh, uh, states. So the first thing is you have fiscal decentralization, but you cannot have fiscal decentralization that is effective unless you also have administrative decentralization. It's just like the whole transportation system in this country is run from Putrajaya. Every bus station in Ipoh was decided, its location was decided in Putrajaya. Basically, lo local Problems are best solved by local people because they know the condition. They know where they should put the bus uh, stations and so forth. Similarly, we need to have multiple centers of policy initiatives, and that requires the support, the support of a decentralized uh, revenue system of funding, and we need a decentralized bureaucracy, not just one federal bureaucracy, but you actually have state bureaucracies, bigger state bureaucracies. Now, why did we are so centralized? We are so centralized largely because Malaysia was born during the emergency where to fight a determined enemy, you need to focus attention, so you've centralized everything, everything, decision making. And in fact, we got so centralized, it got more central. This habit got expanded when we faced Indonesia in the confrontasi. The first thing we did was to postpone local, to, to postpone local election because you said we shouldn't have local uh, distraction of these local elections because we are fighting uh, Sokano over there. And when Sokano disappeared, the local elections didn't reappear. <laughs> Basically, it's uh, once you have felt the taste of power controlling the other guy's decision making, it's very hard to let go. So we have to recognize now that Malaysia will be a country where there always be some states controlled by the opposition. AMNO is not finished. AMNO has a, a number of states still under its control. And I think that and in the last uh, 2008 elections, a number of states had gone on to the other side. What it means is we need to have a 
revenue system that recognizes that each of the states could be held by, controlled by a different party. And the efficient solution to that is fiscal decentralization, administrative decentralization. This is what that is really important to do. Now, what is one of the harm of uh, this centralization? Is that everything here is here in the Klang Valley. You don't see equivalent public services outside of the Klang Valley. In the second largest city, third largest cities in Malaya, they are truly later kampongs. Nothing matches Kuala Lumpur, the lone metropolis. This is unhealthy. A country should have multiple uh, growth centers. Different parts of the country are good in producing different things. For example, who came up with the, when did the Midwest of the United States become rich? The richest parts of the world are always, nearly always the coastal areas. Because as Adam Smith say, wealth is created by the division of labor. And that can only be division of labor if there is trade. So you live next to the coast, you can trade because shipping is the cheapest form of transportation of goods. So in the center, in most countries, right in the center are the poor places. So when did South Dakota, Nebraska, and so forth become rich? That was when the state governors, in some of them, realized we are mostly agricultural. To be rich, what our, our farmers produce have to have higher productivity. Same input, more output. That's the secret to getting rich. Same input, more output. And how could we do that? We need to have better seeds, better fertilizer, and more efficient forms of irrigation. And so where did they come from? Designed for that specific ecological conditions. The local state universities. When the local state universities were founded in the United States and the land grant system, they were tasked with local economic development. If you don't support it, we'll, you are not funded. Like, it is incredible that the silicon industry in Penang grew so much, even though USM for many years just did not support that industry at all. Largely because we are academic. As if academic means we are useless. <laughs> that is incredible. So it comes back to it. The states ought to be able to finance the universities so that they can use, harness the universities for technological advances that are suitable for the local conditions. Now, having talked, uh, I could say more about decentralization and its good things, but we're running out of time. The second topic I want to talk about is on GLC. I think our GLCs have grown cancerously. They are crowding out the private sector. A recent book says, our GSCs are good because look, they are run by professionals. They get MBAs from all the good schools. And furthermore, they are not losing money. Not, not losing money, but how much are they contributing to the treasury? We want to have a KPI where they are efficient. The truth is, GLCs, State-owned companies are always less efficient because the government of the day cannot resist the temptation of using them as instruments of political patronage. If someone you like, you, someone who opposes you, the way to buy him off is, I'll give you chairmanship of this GLC. And if a civil servant say, no, what you ask me to do is against the law, don't worry, do it, retire, and I'll get you a seat on the GLC. And when it comes to political, uh, when it comes to uh, election time, the GLC finds a way to make contributions to the campaign. Basically, they are cash cows for the, for the government of the day. 
This is why GLCs are political animals. So what is even worse is if they get into trouble, like if they borrow a lot of foreign uh, uh, loan, if they take a lot of foreign loans and they go bankrupt, the central government has to bail them out. Now, the question is, how do you reform GLCs? If GLCs could have been run efficiently, the East Germans would have figured out how to do it. <laughs> it is in the nature of state-owned companies because of the political nature. They are inefficient. But whenever someone talks about reforming GLCs, everybody in the cabinet will disagree because each ministry are aligned with certain GLCs. And that's the ATM of the minister and the high bureaucrats. That is why at the crucial meeting in reforming state-owned enterprises, Chu Rongji opened the meeting with the SOE managers, state enterprise managers with this statement. I have come here with two coffins, one coffin for you and one coffin for me. Because reforming state enterprises is almost like a societal act for the person doing it. The only time when, but if you don't do it, there's no future. It's just like the, the SOAP union ended, not because somebody attacked it, because it imploded. The GLCs, through pure mismanagement, the, their internal dynamics, brought about a bankruptcy that caused it, the country to collapse. So when you come down to it, here, we've got a solution for how to deal with the short run increase in deficit from removing GST right away. We downsize the GLCs. What, why GLCs cannot possibly build houses better than the private sector? Why is the GLC in, in that kind of work? We should sell them off and use that revenue to make up for the temporary uh, shortfall in government revenue. The third thing I want to say very quickly is about the financial sector. The biggest, the best way to improve income distribution is to have a lot of small, medium, and a vibrant small, medium enterprises. In Malaysia, the small, medium enterprises are all screaming, we cannot expand, we cannot even do a normal production because it's difficult for us to get operating capital. So what's the state response? We set up an SME bank for you. The government set up an SME bank for you. But how did SMEs used to operate before? Because before 1999, Malaysia has a lot of small and medium banks. And the fact, ladies and gentlemen, all over the world, the only banks that lend to SMEs are small and medium banks. So the solution is not the state solution. You, don't, you cannot find enough capital, we give you an SME bank. The solution is, and the monopoly banking system of big banks allowed the establishment of small and medium banks. And the result of this large monopoly banking system is an ex technologically exceedingly backward payment system compared with how people pay for things in China. You even pay the beggar with your iPhone. <laughs> Over here, I cannot even uh, pay for a restaurant meal with my iPhone. I, they, the, this whole scanning thing does not exist. And that has to do with over-regulation by Bank Negra Malaysia, helped by the fact that the limited number of banks are colluding to keep out the competition. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wu, for your usual refreshing views. He is a great traveler, and he picks up all these ideas from all over the world and uh, brings it to our attention for our own benefit. Yeah.